This is the Music Halls of Fame podcast. This week we honor the year of 1987 along with a member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame class of 1987. We also look at the case for putting Motley Crue into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Plus our Spotlight Hall of Fame is the Canadian Music Hall of Fame in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Before we get going with the podcast, like everyone tells you, please like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so you'll know when these podcast episodes drop, which is usually every Thursday. Now, on to this week's episode. The year was 1987. In music, alt-rock continued its journey from college radio to the mainstream, thanks in part to the influence of MTV. Bands like Husker Du, Dinosaur Jr., and Sonic Youth began to break through a little, and if you hung out in your local record store at the time, then you might have heard the rumblings of some bands in Seattle called Soundgarden and the Melvins. The hair band era got jump-started by Bon Jovi, whose second album, Slippery When Wet, became a mega-selling album and unleashed a ton of copycat bands. Nikki Six of Motley Crue was clinically dead after a heroin overdose, but was revived by paramedics. U2 released the Joshua Tree album, Michael Jackson released Bad, Prince released Sign of the Times, Pink Floyd released their first album without Roger Waters called A Momentary Lapse of Reason, Def Leppard released Hysteria, and Guns N' Roses released Appetite for Destruction. George Michael's Faith, in Excess's biggest selling album, Kick, and the Dirty Dancing soundtrack all came out later in the year, with the success of those albums mainly being felt in 1988. MTV Europe started in 1987, as did Kylie Minogue's career when her version of the song The Locomotion became a big hit. Whitney Houston became the first female solo artist to debut at number one on the Billboard Albums chart when her sophomore album Whitney was released. Elton John had throat surgery, which left his voice lower. The single, or cassette single, made its debut in 1987. The first single to be released was Brian Adams' song, Heat of the Night. Another big music business event happened on November 18th, when CBS Records was bought by Sony for $2 billion. The top 10 best-selling albums of 1987, according to Billboard magazine, were Bon Jovi's Slippery When Wet, Paul Simon's Graceland, Beastie Boys' License to Ill, Bruce Hornsby and the Ranges, The Way It Is, Janet Jackson's Control, U2's The Joshua Tree, Huey Lewis and the News' is Four, Cinderella's Night Songs, Anita Baker's Rapture, and Genesis's Invisible Touch. The top 10 best-selling singles, according to Billboard magazine, were The Bangles' Walk Like an Egyptian, Hearts' is Alone, Gregory Abbott's Shake You Down, Whitney Houston's I Want to Dance with Somebody, Starship's Nothing's Gonna Stop Us Now, Robbie Neville's C'est La Vie, White Snake's Here I Go Again, Bruce Hornsby and the Ranges The Way It Is, Bob Seger's Shakedown from the Beverly Hills Cop 2 soundtrack and Bon Jovi's Living on a Prayer. In country music, Randy Travis had the biggest album of the year with Always and Forever. Other artists with big albums included Alabama, Hank Williams Jr., George Strait, Reba McIntyre, The Judds, Restless Heart, Dolly Parton, Linda Ronstant, and Emmy Lou Harris, and Dwight Yoakam. Artists with big country singles included Randy Travis with Forever and Ever, Amen, Michael Johnson, The Judds, Dan Seals, Reba McIntyre, Merle Haggard, Highway 101, The Forrester Sisters, Roseanne Cash, and Ricky Van Shelton. Hip-hop continued creeping into the mainstream as LL Cool J, Boogie Down Productions, Eric B. and Rakim, and Public Enemy made noise. LL's second album, Bigger and Deffer, was released, which had the first hip-hop ballad to become a hit, I Need Love. And it also had his iconic song, I'm Bad, 
Public Enemy debuted with their album, Yo Bum Rush the Show. Cool Mo D had How You Like Me Now. Heavy D and the Boys had Mr. Big Stuff. Eric B and Rakim had The Legendary Paid in Full and Move the Crowd. Ice T had the album Rhyme Pays. Boogie Down Production had Criminal Minded. Audio 2 released Top Billin. And Easy E released the song Boys in the Hood. Dance music on the charts was still populated by pop and R&B artists like Madonna, along with Jody Watley, ABC, George Michael, and Janet and Michael Jackson. There were big one-hit wonder dance tracks like Yellow's Oh Yeah from the Ferris Bueller's Day Off soundtrack. And Paul Lekakis' classically titled song, Boom Boom Boom, Let's Go Back to My Room. Seriously, that was the title of the song. Generation X would like to publicly apologize to you now for that one. Although, I ain't gonna lie, <laughs> that song is damn catchy. Sorry. Not sorry. If you were in Chicago or Detroit, however, then you were probably hitting the underground clubs like the Warehouse in Chicago to listen to two forms of dance music that were going around in the club scene at least, house music and techno music. If you were in Great Britain, though, then you already felt the tremors of EDM as Steve Silk Hurley's song, Jack Your Body, became the first house track to hit number one on the British charts. Also, freestyle group Expose broke through to the mainstream when their song, Come Go With Me, hit number one, while Company B hit number one with the song Fascinated. 1987 was also the year that Kraftwerk hit the top of the dance charts in America. In Latin music, the biggest artists of the year were Jose Jose, Juan Gabriel, Braulio, Emmanuel, Jose Feliciano, Los Bucas, Los Tigres del Norte, Little Joe, Vicente Fernandez, and Los Yannix. Musicals or revivals of musicals that were around in 1987 included Cabaret, Dreamgirls, Into the Woods, Les Miserables, and Anything Goes. Musical films that came out in 1987 included Dirty Dancing and La Bamba, about the short but amazing life of singer Richie Valens. Bands that formed in 1987 included Allison Krauss and Union Station, Alice in Chains, Animal Logic, Third Base, 808 State, Bullet Boys, Danger Danger, Danzig, Diggable Planets, Digital Underground, After Seven, DC Talk, Delirium, Bad English, Blues Traveler, Femme Fatale, Fugazi, Callaway, The Gin Blossoms, Green Day, Guy, Giant, Inner City, Jagged Edge, Jungle Brothers, Kid and Play, The Jesus Lizard, Meat Beat Manifesto, Mars, Luna Chicks, The Roots, Ugly Kid Joe, and a little band known as Nirvana. Bands that called it quits, at least until the inevitable reunions, or took an official hiatus included the Bay City Rollers, Baltimore, Berlin, the Mary Jane Girls, Modern English, Nana, The Smiths, GTR, General Public, Husker Du, The Violent Femmes, Twisted Sister, and the aforementioned Mars, who put out one album, had a worldwide Eurodance hit called Pump Up the Volume, Dance, Dance, and then broke up. All in one year. Bands that actually did the reunion thing in 1987 included the Doobie Brothers, Leonard Skinnerd, and Prism. Musical artists who were born in 1987 included DJ Afrojack, rappers Meek Mill, Kendrick Lamar, Wiz Khalifa, Bow Wow, Justina Valentine, Jay Park, and Dougie Pointer of McFly, singers Frank Ocean, Aaron Carter, Diana DeGarmo, Kevin Jonas of the Jonas Brothers, Marcus Mumford of Mumford & Sons, Dan Reynolds of Imagine Dragons, Brendan Urie of Panic at the Disco, Tyler Hubbard of Florida Georgia Line, Dan Myers of Dan and Shay, Kesha, and Jesse McCartney. Musical artists who passed away in 1987 included Paul Butterfield of the Paul Butterfield Blues Band, the founder of the New York Blue Note Jazz Nightclub, Alfred Lyon, entertainer extraordinaire Liberace, guitarist Bola Sette, singer Dean Paul Martin Jr., French singer Dalida, 
cellist Jacqueline Dupree, bassist Jaco Pastorius of Weather Report, known as probably the greatest bassist of all time, actually, drummer Buddy Rich, also known as one of the greatest drummers of all time, Maria Augusta Von Trapp of the Von Trapp family, singer Maxine Sullivan, drummer Carlton Barrett, and guitarist Peter Tosh of Bob Marley and the Wailers, who was murdered in a home invasion. In award ceremonies for the music of 1987, U2 won Album of the Year at the Grammy Awards for The Joshua Tree, while Paul Simon won Record of the Year for Graceland. Somewhere out there from an American Tales soundtrack won Song of the Year, and Jody Watley won Best New Artist. At the MTV Video Music Awards, Peter Gabriel's Sledgehammer won Music Video of the Year. At the American Music Awards for the music of 1987, Whitney Houston, Paul Simon, and Bon Jovi were the big winners. Michael Jackson, Whitney Houston, and Levert were the big winners at the Soul Train Music Awards. Kenny Rogers, Whitney Houston, and Bon Jovi won the music categories at the People's Choice Awards, and the Billboard Music Awards didn't actually start until 1990. At the Eurovision Singing Contest, which was held that year in Brussels, Belgium, Johnny Logan from Ireland won for the song Hold Me Now. Hank Williams Jr. won Entertainer of the Year at the Academy of Country Music Awards and also at the Country Music Association Awards. Sting won Album of the Year for Nothing Like the Sun and Rick Astley won Single of the Year for Never Gonna Give You Up at the Brit Awards. Brian Adams won Entertainer of the Year. Kim Mitchell won Album of the Year for Shaken Like a Human Being, and Glass Tiger won Song of the Year for Someday at the Juno Awards. Ice House won Album of the Year for Man of Colors, and Midnight Oil won Song of the Year for Beds Are Burning at the Aria Music Awards. At the Tony Awards, Les Miserables won Best Musical, and All My Sons won Best Revival of a Musical. Musically, at the Academy Awards, The Last Emperor won Best Film Score, while I've Had the Time of My Life from the Dirty Dancing soundtrack won Best Song. The Pulitzer Prize for Music was won that year by John Harbison for The Flight into Egypt. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction ceremony was held on January 21st, 1987 at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York City. At the ceremony, record executives Amit Erdogan, Jerry Wexler, and Leonard Chess, along with record producers Jerry Lieber and Mike Stoller, were inducted into the non-performers category. Louis Jordan, T. Bone Walker, and Hank Williams Sr. were inducted into the early influencers category. In the performers category, Aretha Franklin became the first woman to be inducted into the hall. Other performers who were inducted into the category included the Coasters, Bo Diddley, Marvin Gaye, B.B. King, Bill Haley, Roy Orbison, Carl Perkins, Clyde McFadder, Smokey Robinson, Muddy Waters, Jackie Wilson, Big Joe Turner, Rick Nelson, and this next artist. Eddie Cochran was born on October 3, 1938, in Albert Lea, Minnesota, but moved to Bell Gardens, California. It was in California where he was able to get his music career going. He started off his career in junior high school and actually quit high school as a freshman to become a musician. During a show, he met Hank Cochran, who was not related to Eddie, and the two of them formed a group called the Cochran Brothers and recorded a few singles with Echo Records that were moderately successful. They didn't stay together for too long, only about a year or so. Eddie started making solo rockabilly records in 1956 after getting signed to Crest Records, and soon, because he wore nice clothes and was good-looking, Eddie was asked to perform in movies like The Girl Can't Help It, where he performed his song 20 Flight Rock and Untamed Youth. Once people saw him in the movies, he began to catch on. It was also around this time that he released his only album while he was alive, Singing to My Baby. In 1957, his new record label, Liberty Records, wanted him to become a crooner, 
due to his good looks and his habit of wearing those nice clothes. So on this album, there weren't many of his rockabilly songs. Soon after the release of the songs from that album, he went back to recording and releasing songs that were more to his taste and style and his reputation. These new songs got worldwide attention like Come On Everybody, Three Steps to Heaven, Something Else, and Teenage Heaven. While he was putting out his own work, he was also doing session work with artists like Gene Vincent, as Eddie was a talented musician playing drums, bass, piano, and guitar. The song Summertime Blues is probably the song everybody knows him for. He co-wrote the rebellious song about dealing with authority with his manager, Jerry Capehart. Eddie recorded it on March 28, 1958. The song was originally a B-side, but became a hit on its own when it was released on July 21, 1958. The single went to number eight in America. The song's also been covered by a number of artists, including the Beach Boys, country music singer Alan Jackson, and the 60s group Blue Cheer, who did a very hard rockish kind of version of it. Unfortunately for Eddie, he did not live too much longer to enjoy his success. After his friends Buddy Holly and Richie Valens died in the plane crash in 1959, Eddie thought that he might end up dying young. He was right. On April 16th, 1960, Eddie was coming back from a concert in England with singer Gene Vincent in a speeding taxi when the taxi blew a tire and spun out of control, hitting a lamppost. Gene Vincent was injured, but Eddie was thrown from the vehicle and passed away from head injuries. Eddie was only 21 years old when he passed away. During his brief life, Eddie wrote and recorded rockabilly songs that captured teenage life in the 1950s. He also wasn't afraid to try out new technology and recording styles, including distortion and overdubbing. In his lifetime, Eddie released one studio album, one compilation album, which was actually released the year that he died, and four EPs. Of those, four hit the top 20 in America, with three of those four going top 10. Eddie also released 18 singles while he was alive, with two of those 18 going top 40 in America, including one of those two going top 10. That would be Summertime Blues at number 8. As with most artists who pass away when they're young, his legend only grew afterwards, as did his chart success. Like they say, death is a great career move. You're just not around to enjoy the benefits. Eddie's style influenced everyone, from Springsteen to Hendrix to Rush to Tom Petty. You name it. If you bent the notes on a guitar, then you were influenced, whether you knew it or not, by Eddie Cochran. It was his signature innovation. Eddie was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1987 in only its second induction class. Such was the importance of Eddie Cochran, and such was the importance of his songs about rebellion. Presented for induction by Mick Jones of Class of 2003 Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductees The Clash, Eddie Cochran, inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1987, and we have a selection of his music on this week's podcast music playlist, the link to which is in the show notes. Before we go any further, we'd like to tell you that there is now a Music History In-Depth podcast where we go more in-depth on a few of the events that happened in music history for that particular week. The Music History In-Depth podcast drops every Tuesday on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts from, as does our Music History Today podcast, which goes over the daily events in music history. The Music History Today podcast drops daily, including weekends, on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. Now, back to this podcast. Let's look at the case for putting California band Motley Crue into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. 
In an era that has now seen 80s rock bands with big fan bases get inducted into the hall, like Bon Jovi, Journey, and Def Leppard, you would think that Motley Crue would probably be next. So, why haven't they? We'll get to that in a minute. First, to the tale of the tape we go. Motley Crue released nine studio albums, three live albums, eight compilation albums, and three EPs. Out of those... 10 went top 40 in America, with six of those top 10, with Dr. Feelgood actually hitting number one. They also released 46 singles. Out of those, 34 went top 40 on the various American charts, with 14 of those 34 going top 10, including 1985's Home Sweet Home going to the top of the charts. Motley Crue sold over 100 million albums worldwide, including 25 million in America alone. They influenced tons of different groups in the 80s hairband era and beyond. Plus, with their live shows and huge fan base even to this very day, you would think that at this point, with all of the big 80s rock bands getting in, that Motley Crue would be next for induction. You would be wrong. And the reason is because of something else going on these days. If anyone saw the TV movie Dirt about the band's career, then they saw a sanitized version of the band's own autobiography. There's Vince Neil's 1984 car accident that killed Razzle Dingley of Hanoi Rocks, for which Neil served time in prison for vehicular manslaughter as his blood alcohol was over the legal drunk driving limit at that point. There's Tommy Lee and his assorted domestic abuse and violent episodes. There were, like a lot of artists, issues with drug use. For instance, Nikki Six's overdose and clinical death only to be brought back by paramedics. In their autobiography, the band talked about forcing themselves on women to the point where it allegedly went beyond sexual harassment. Among those stories was one where they got a homeless woman to come up to a room and one member of the band and his friends took turns with her and then tossed her out. Now, five years ago, that might have gotten you a slight chuckle from the Hall of Fame voting members and chalked up to the usual shoulder shrug of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Not anymore. The hashtag MeToo movement has finally begun to catch up with the music industry. According to Nikki Six in a recent interview when he was asked the question about induction, he said that he was told directly by a few voting members that there was no way that they were ever going to get in because of their past behavior. That may change if some of the voters' minds change in 10 years or so, but it won't be any time soon. My personal feeling is that groups and athletes should be inducted based on their professional achievements, not their moral ones, so long as their personal issues don't help their professional achievements, case in point, sports and steroids. You could add a note on their plaque that says, oh, by the way, they personally did such and such. For instance, the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture still has a display about Bill Cosby, but there is a plaque that is plainly seen, and front and center to be honest with you, that mentions his extremely serious legal issues, and I use the words extremely serious legal issues in a very understated way. However, If you had to cut worthy artists from being in the hall because of a strict biblical code, sex, drug use, alcohol abuse, whatever, then your hall shrinks to, what, 10 people maybe? Again, just my personal opinion, you're free to disagree, but I'm really not into canceling artists from winning awards or other honors because of their personal matters, including their political opinions, I might add. And that's on either side of that equation, be it a Ted Nugent or whoever says something liberal these days. Are some of the guys in Motley Crue, insert whatever swear word you want to hear? Yes. Should they be denied entry into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame because of their being 
insert whatever swear word you want to hear? No, not in my opinion anyway. And there you have it. Motley Crue should be inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame based on the number of records sold, number of rock singles that went top 40 on the charts, their continued fan base, and their influence and near dominance of 80s hard rock, along with Bon Jovi, Journey, Def Leppard, and Van Halen, among many others. Those groups, by the way, are all in the hall. Yet, they more than likely won't get in because of their past behavior. That seems to be the deciding factor, at least as of now. And with that being said, that kind of makes me wonder which other bands that might have been on the bubble with getting into the hall have now been told that they will never get in because of what they did in the past. In America, the main lobby group for the recording industry and the one who gives out the Grammy Awards is the Recording Academy. Its Canadian equivalent is the Canadian Academy of the Recording Arts and Sciences. Their version of the Grammys are the Juno Awards. In 1978, the Canadian Academy started inducting groups into the Canadian Music Hall of Fame. The Physical Hall was opened in 2016 as a part of the National Music Center on Level 5 of Studio Bell at 854th Street Southeast in Calgary, Alberta. The center is open Thursday to Sunday, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Price of admission is to pay what you can. As with everything these days, check with their website for updated hours of operation, studiobell.ca is its website and we will throw that into the show notes for you unlike the rock and roll hall of fame which normally has six or more artists being inducted depending on various category committees the canadian hall usually only inducts one maybe two groups into its hall per year in fact it's only inducted more than one artist per year about six or seven times since 1978 Corey Hart, that's his real name, not a stage name, was born on May 31, 1962. He started out in the entertainment industry as a child singer at the age of 11, where he sang for Tom Jones. He also sang in the World Popular Song Festival in Tokyo, where he made connections with people like Grammy-winning singer-songwriter Christopher Cross. Back in Canada, he continued singing and went deeper into songwriting. On a whim, he contacted Billy Joel when Billy was in Montreal for a concert to see about getting some help making demo tapes. Billy was so impressed with Corey that Corey ended up going to Long Island, New York to cut his demo tape with Billy's backup band. Finally, after he turned 20 and after years of rejections, Corey got a recording contract with Aquarius Records. Corey's first album was called First Offense, released with two Canadian versions on November 11, 1983. At first, the album didn't do too well. It started to pick up a little steam in Canada after a bit, but it was DOA in America. Aquarius Records even had problems finding representatives in America to push the album. But then... They wisely decided to release the song Sunglasses at Night on January 21st, 1984. That song, with its now classic cheesy 80s video, hit number 7 on Billboard's Top 100 Singles Chart and was the 36th biggest single of 1984, became a staple on 80s classic radio streaming stations near you. It also went top 40 in four other countries, including Canada. The album, First Offense, finally got its American release in 1984 and got as high as number 31. Back in Canada, the album and the single garnered Corey four Juno Award nominations, winning for Best Video. Yes, that cheesy 80s video where they're in a prison, and it's kind of funny. Anyway, the follow-up single, It Ain't Enough, hit number four four in Canada, but it also hit number 17 in America, even though it's not as remembered. 
Corey's second album, Boy in the Box, was released on June 14, 1985. That album sold very well in Canada and got Corey four top 30 songs in Canada. Boy in the Box hit number seven, Everything in My Heart hit number one, and Eurasian Eyes hit number one. His biggest hit from that album, and the one that he would win the Juno Award for Single of the Year, was Never Surrender, which hit number one in Canada and number three in America. The previously mentioned songs from this album that did well in Canada did not do too well in America, with Boy in the Box getting to number 26 and Everything in My Heart hitting number 30. After that, Corey had five more top 40 singles in America, three from his 1986 album, Fields of Fire, one from his 1988 album, Young Man Running, and one from his 1990 album, Bang. In Canada, though, his career was a completely different story. In total, Corey had 31 top 40 singles. Out of those, 10 went top 10, including one as recently as 2018, with three of those 10 hitting number one. He has been nominated for 20 Juno Awards and counting winning two of them. Even though he's known for only two songs in America, as far as classic rock radio stations are concerned, he is far bigger in his home country of Canada, which is why he was inducted into the Canadian Music Hall of Fame. Corey Hart, inducted into the Canadian Music Hall of Fame in Calgary, Alberta, Canada in 2019, and of course we will put his music onto this week's podcast playlist, the link to which is in the show notes. The Music Halls of Fame podcast is part of the Music History Today network, which can be found under Music History Today on Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, or wherever you get your podcast from, and also on our YouTube page under Music History Today. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>